Hi, I'm Dr. Jennifer Bird. I'm a biblical scholar and I care about what people do with what they find in the Bible. I care very much about what people have done with certain verses in the Christian Bible and made them say all kinds of interesting things about big, really important topics or relationships or realms of our lives. <laughs> And so I'm doing a, in this Does the Bible Tell You So series, I'm doing kind of a sub-series on marriage in the Bible. What do the texts say, right? Which is also the title of a book that I have coming out this fall. And so the first four videos in this series actually are based on the four passages that are usually turned to to help people define marriage. So they, you know, Genesis 128, 224, Matthew 19, 4 to 6, and then Ephesians 5, 31, 32. And they basically are saying are used to say procreation is only for marriage. Um, may, you know, monogamy between a man and a woman and no sex before marriage. Matthew 19 is used to say no divorce. And then Ephesians 5 is used to say, and this is a sacred thing that's that marriage between a man and a woman is akin to the, the union between Christ and the church. So we're on to that last one, Ephesians 5, 31, 32. And then after this video, I'm gonna go in to other passages in the Bible that actually inform what marriage looks like in the Bible. So that's what, that's what you have to look forward to next. There's a lot to say by, about Ephesians 5, 31 and 32. And I'm trying to make these kind of brief. So let me give you a couple highlights of things to think about if you're going to think about what these passages are saying and doing. So let me read the first, let me read the verses to you first, and then I'll back up and kind of put it in context and offer some food for thought. Okay. So 31 and 32, here we go. Quote. So he's like out of nowhere, right? We're quoting. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his woman. My translation says wife, but I, in, the, in the Greek it says woman. And the two will become one flesh. So if you've watched the first three videos in this, in this series, you know that, I, that the writer has just quoted Genesis 2.24, which is why it's so important to talk about it here, because they're quoting it to talk about marriage, but I don't think Genesis 2.24 is talking about marriage. So they're quoting it just like Matthew 19 did, right? So for this reason, this is gonna happen, end quote. This is a great mystery, and I am applying it to Christ in the church. Okay, like I said, there's a lot to say here. So let me, let me hit some highlights. First of all, this comes at the end of an exchange, what we refer to as, or end of a section that we refer to as the household codes. And there's, um, there's a directive to the women, there's a directive to the men, and after this, what we just read, there's a quick piece to children, in, as in being obedient to their fathers, and then slaves, enslaved peoples, being obedient to their masters. And then there, there's actually a passage to the masters to be kind to your enslaved people. So it comes in this kind of package thing that shows up a few times in the Newer Testament writings, okay? And so what's interesting to me is that, and many other people as well, is that the opening of this section has this line, be subject to one another out of reverence for Christ. Oh, subject to one another sounds like mutuality to me. But then the very next verse says, women be subject to your men as you are to the Lord. That just put up a hierarchy immediately. Like immediately after the be subject to one another, then we just said women be subject to your men, which is usually translated wives be subject to your husbands, by the way, which is also a thing to think about, as, as you are to the Lord. So you're being subject to your man as if he's your Lord. That just went from equality to submission, right? And we get this whole thing, right? And it's, it's not great for men either. I think that's important to note. And we've got this thing where men are being told to love their women, which is lovely and kind of progressive at the time, right? To, to actually acknowledge your women as worthy of respect. That's interestingly new. But then we get down to this thing about, right, you know, because a man, you know, he who loves his woman loves himself. They treat his woman as their own body. Like that's, that is lovely, right? That's really nice. And this whole thing, and for this reason, blah, blah, blah. And this is a great mystery. I'm come, and I am applying it to Christ in the church. And Christ is the head of the body, which is his, 
the church is his body and the church is also his bride. So Christ as a husband to the bride, church or head to the body. And that's how we get this whole head. The, the man is the head over the woman and she's, she gets to be the neck and turn the head where you want it to go. All kinds of really interesting things. But ultimately, what's so we've got this hierarchy, right? Christ in the church. Christ is married to the church. There's so many things to say here. Let me just keep, let me just point out this. Why aren't they also reading the next verse, which is verse 33, which says, Each of you, however, should love his woman as himself. English usually says wife as himself. And a woman should fear her man. So the English translation here that I have in front of me says, however, you should, each of you should love his wife as himself and a wife should respect her husband. But the Greek says that men should, lo should love their woman as himself and a woman should fear her man. And people want to say, well, that's the same as respect, but it actually isn't because it's about fear. <laughs> It's the same phobos that we use to have, that we, when we attach phobia at the end of a word to say arachnophobia, arachne, arachne is, is spider, arachnophobia is a fear of spiders. Like we're talking about a fear. <laughs> and women are not being asked the same thing in their relationship to men as men are being asked in relationship to women. So why are they pulling 31 and 32 out of context? That's one of my questions. Why, what is being done here when you compare marriage between a, two people to Christ and the church? And one of the things that happened here in, the, in terms of the history of the church is it, this is the language that's used to make or to justify the idea of marriage as a sacrament, this, this verse, okay? So there's that. Um, we've got all kinds of things going on here. Um, what I find really fun and interesting and it's kind of a way to help you think differently about this is when you talk about Christ and the church as married, most people think of then the church is the bride is female, but who is it in the who is it that gets to be the leader of the church? Now, even at the time that this was written, women got to be the leaders of the churches at, in some cases, and but it is not long after the writing of the Newer Testament writings that the early church has decided to remove women's authority and power to be leaders. So that what we have in this kind of odd way is Christ marrying the church is actually um, two men getting married because for many years only men could be heads of the church or representatives of the church. This is a great mystery and I'm applying it to Christ and the church, to becoming one flesh. Christ and the male head of the church. I mean, I know, maybe that seems like a stretch, but it's not a stretch at all if you turn it into a female because that's how it's been talked about for centuries. <laughs> that the church is the bride, is female. She is the body to Christ's head, male to female, so that we have this man is head over the woman. What's the, the, the backside of this passage that makes me just so devastated by, you know, is, is that this does go a long way in justifying for people this belief that marriage is only between a man and a woman. It should only be between a man and a woman because Christ is thought of as a male and the church is thought of as a female. And so, and then it is sacralized. This relationship between Christ and the church is turned into a sacrament or at least on some sort of holy language level for people. That is then what to humans entering into marriage, um, that's the role or the example that is set for them, right? That as Christ and the church are one, so are two people who are married. So we have all this really intense theological meaning then that is brought into the picture for Christians. And this is, I'm, I have so much to say about this and I'm already at 10 minutes. So I'm going to just at, suggest that you perhaps check out the book when it comes out. But, you know, th there are all kinds of pieces to this that f over the centuries and the language that's built up around it, you know, 
for people who take this very seriously or kind of a little bit more literally maybe than some, many Christians do think of a Christian marriage, that is a marriage between two Christians, as being qualitatively better than a marriage between two other people who don't identify as Christian. So a marriage between just two non-religious people isn't as special or powerful or important because they aren't thinking of it as being a union between God and Christ or between Christ and the church, you know, that holy sacred union that the church has language for. A Hindu and a, and a Muslim getting married is nowhere near as special as between two Christians when they get married. And when and Christians do have this belief. I, I say it because I, I used to, you know, like I used to think of it that way because of all this language and the sacralization of marriage that this passage endorses in a Christian context for Christians. So it's special and different than when two name your what Jews get married. It's different. This is better and sacred. So there's a lot on the line right? When we talk about marriage in this country and we talk about laws around marriage and all these different things, and it's, it's just worth being aware that there's a lot going on theologically, even if we're talking about it in a secular context. People will have baggage they're not even necessarily conscious of. They'll have ideas about marriage that they're bringing to that conversation, whether or not they're being asked to talk about it or elucidate it, okay? And again, just like with the other three passages that are used to define biblical marriage, these two are taken out of context and they aren't, right? So we're, mi so we're missing part of what the passage, the author himself or themselves were trying to say, right? Um, and, and even if we just take it as its intent, like in context, what it's trying to say, I think it's worth reconsidering. I think the claim being made in this passage is simply worth reconsidering. This is a great mystery. I'm applying it to Christ and the church because that language itself has been so harmful to so many millions of people. The belief of, in, in that idea, endorsing that idea as special, how that then teaches people to think about themselves in contrast to others and therefore treat others or... I mean, there's just a lot of us and them happening because of this particular passage. There's a lot of heteronormativity being justified because of this passage. There's just a lot going on in this passage. <laughs> and I really just would like people to not have to, to not, to not endorse harmful ideas based on scripture. I'd, I'd really like people to not, not have to feel like they have to endorse a harmful idea because it's in their scripture. You know, like I think it's okay to let go of harmful ideas, even if it's in your scriptures. What do I know, right? I just used to believe these things and endorse them and uphold them and see how it made me think about people. <laughs> so now I'm trying to talk about that for you. Anyway, maybe there's, I hope there's something helpful in here for you. And next time we're going to move on to talking about what marriages in the Bible actually look like. So, see you next time. <laughs>